is the Danger Close Podcast. Beyond the books with me, Jack Carr. Welcome to the Danger Close Podcast, an ironclad original presented by Six Hour. My guest today is Stephen Pressfield. Stephen Pressfield is the author of Gates of Fire, Legend of Bagger Vance, Afghan Campaign, and a host of other books. His latest novel is A Man at Arms. And we didn't get into it as much as I wanted to on the podcast because he kept asking me questions about my latest novel, about writing, about the Amazon series with Chris Pratt. So uh, we had a great time, great conversation. And uh, he's also the author of a series of books on creativity. Uh, you may have heard of The War of Art, Turning Pro, Do the Work, Authentic Swing, uh, Warrior Ethos. Uh, anyone involved in any sort of creative endeavor, read these books. So without further ado, my friend, the great Stephen Pressfield. All right, Stephen Pressfield. Thank you so much for jumping on the podcast. I'm so excited to see you. And uh, especially just because it's a chance for us to catch up for about 45 minutes, which is, yeah, really. uh, is my favorite it's part of this. Great to see you, Jack. Great to see you. We've missed each other twice when you were here filming. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, so this will have to do for the time being until we can see each other in person. That's right. But hopefully the next congratulations. time I'm out. Oh, thank Let me you. say right away, congratulations on the success of The Devil's Hand. I read it. I love it. It's oh, great. We can talk a lot about it. And congratulations on your stuff with Chris Pratt and the filming and everything that's going on with you. God bless you. You're smoking hot. Well, thank you so much. I mean, the inspiration, I mean, I, I have uh, just outside of the frame here are all the other, not just your books, but the ones you've inspired me to actually to read from your reading list. And ah. uh, the ones my wife is like, what is this obscure thing showing up that you bid <laughs> on on eBay? That there was one left. And uh, so I have those all over here. But uh, no, it's so great to, to see. You. And hopefully I'll get to, to, we get to link up in person next time I'm out in Los Angeles. So. Okay. And what is that behind you? You've got a professional studio there now. What's going on? You have the full on well, setup. This well, is not what's like happened you, but here. we do have a microphone, you know, we got a little blackout curtain behind, you know? Yeah, you're getting uh, all set Elf's here. Man back here. I don't know if I, you can I see I it. I noticed. I sure <laughs> did. I noticed it. <laughs> yep. And man at arms right here. I have both of, uh, with this one you signed for me and one I, uh, I purchased obviously ah, to, uh, that's to where I have the two. cause. I have one signed from you and one that I got uh, myself. Yeah. That is so nice. Thank you. But yeah, yeah, I always like to buy, uh, the books obviously from, from people that, uh, that I know and respect and, and, uh, uh am very fond of. So yeah, this was amazing. I loved reading this and I loved that you let me read it early and, uh, I got to give you a blur, but just getting, being able to read this book early was, uh, was such an honor. So thank you for, uh, for trusting me with that. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, so great to read your stuff always, Jack. We can really get into that as we talk. Oh, awesome. Um, what is that behind you? What typewriter is that behind you? What's going on there? This typewriter here is, mm -hmm. um, it's not actually the original typewriter that I used to carry for years in my van in my when I was living in my Chevy van, but it's, it is an old funky one from uh, uh, an ad agency where I used to work many moons ago when this was what you worked on. And at one point they were moving on to IBM, whatever. And they said, we're selling all these. So I bought it and I've had it for years. Yeah. They actually sold it though. They didn't just give them away. They didn't just space. give them away. I think this was like 25 bucks or something. Wow. Like yeah. But uh, what, what year is that? Do you know? Yeah. Um, I don't, you know, it's got to be the seventies or something or earlier. Yeah. It's beautiful. I yeah. love that. I'm, I'm going to get in, I'm really getting into typewriters these days. And when we move to the next house, I want to have the, my library. I'm looking over here because my books are now stacked up in front of me here on shelves that go three deep. Uh, we're in the last house. They were right behind me and we're in this rental right now. Uh -huh. But next one, I want to put a lot of thought into the library. So I'm not reaching back three deep to try to like pull a book out that uh -huh. I need to reference and knocking things over in the process. Um, so I want to get a little more organized. I mean, they're organized here, but they're just a little more difficult to get to. Um, but I want to have them spaced out with typewriters from, uh, ah. from different eras uh, throughout. So I want so I can look over there and uh, and have a kind of a history of the typewriter as, uh, as we you know, move up. I don't know if day. you know this, Jack, but Tom Hanks is a tremendous, do you know this is a tremendous typewriter aficionado. He's got like hundreds of them. He does. And in, in fact, when I first got this, or I, I had to get it refurbished. I actually boxed it up and sent it to New York from California to his typewriter guy that, you know, refurbished it. You know, I read about it somewhere in, you know, some story about him, but he's got a, he's got that, you know, hundreds of these things. So 
Yep. There was a show. I think it was on Netflix and I forget the name of it right now, but there was a uh, documentary they did uh, that he, I think he might've produced it, but he was featured prominently uh, where Ah. it showed how he had the typewriters. That's what gave me the idea. Ah. uh, He had like a bookshelf behind him, like a library of typewriters and it was beautiful and I loved it. So that, uh, that, that's a great uh, documentary. I wish I could remember the name right now, but I might have to get the name of that typewriter uh, refurbishment uh, place because the one I was working with, I was going to send a few things to in Berkeley, California, shut down. Uh, uh-huh. So yeah, let's go back a little a little farther there. So typewriter from New York. So let's, uh, let's work up to a man at arms. So let's go from, uh, from Marine Corps, from leaving the Marine Corps, or let's go to boot camp, to Paris Island, and, uh-huh. then, uh, and then out of Paris Island and up to a man at arms for those that, uh, that don't know your backstory. Cause I think most people, uh, know you today and, uh, don't know the lo- the journey that you took unless they've jo- dove in, uh, have, have explored the, um, the nonfiction side of the house on creativity with war of art and turning pro and authentic swing and do the work and all those. And then they get a little bit of a glimpse into that background and that journey and all that work that it uh, it took to get where you are today. So, um, what was that path into the, into the Marine Corps? Um, let's see <laughs> you want me to get Jack, you want me to do like a quick overview? Yeah, of, uh, let's do that. Let's do, let's do I Paris want to ask Island. You a bunch of questions too here. I want <laughs> to interview you a little bit here. <laughs> and, I'm, I'll do and I this have this really amazing quick. cup, by the way, too. I want to work oh, up great. to this. Let's work up to this cup. Cause it worked. It goes in conjunction with a man at arms. And, uh, I wanted to save it. This is my first time actually using it. And it uh, it fits, this is 15 fluid ounces of my black raffle coffee. Wow. And, it fits almost perfectly 15 fluid ounces. Uh, so yeah, this thing is awesome. Thank you for sending this to me. This is uh, okay. Super this is cool. just to, for people to know. This is a uh, a inspired by the Spartan Kothon, K O T H O N, which was uh, Plutarch wrote about it, and it was a the cup that the Spartan army brought with them when they went on military campaigns, and they had to drink out of streams and rivers and stuff like that. And the cup was designed, it had a dark interior, so no matter how crappy the water was, mm-hmm. you couldn't see it. And it also had a concave lip that supposedly would catch the, uh, you know, whatever impurities are there. And that's the Spartan shield there with a lambda for like ketamon on it. It's made by Joel Cherico, master potter in uh, Minnesota. And um if you look up Cherico Pottery, C-H-E-R-R-I-C-O, you can get one of these things. And they ain't cheap. They're like 300 <laughs> bucks a piece. Oh, wow. So, hey. Yeah, I don't know if you knew that, Jack. I did you not know, know that because yeah. you so, just sent it to me. So I didn't. Uh, yeah. <laughs> thank you. I, yeah. Wow. Amazing. That's, that's, it's beautiful. And I did, I read the whole description though. And, uh, and I love that because there was, there's no, obviously no photos of these. There's and no so photos, you kind of had right. to imagine what it would yeah. actually have looked like. So, yeah. um, so I read the whole description and found out about the lip and the color on the inside and all that stuff. So that was, that was fascinating. So I'm probably not going to use it too much cause I'm worried I'm going to break it. So it's going to go right back there with all my, <laughs> all my special stuff here yeah. after, uh, after we have our, our talk here, but, um, yeah, leaving in, into the Marine I mean, Corps, maybe a little, little bit of an overview I'll give you a quick uh, overview. So I really was uh, in the Marine Corps dodging the draft in Vietnam. And I joined as a reservist, you know, hoping that they would not call me up. They definitely <laughs> did not want to go there. And they did not call me up, thank goodness. So, but I was an infantryman. And, you know, as far as, uh, you know, had like one one millionth of your experience, Jack, of the in the military. But, um, the but you did Paris overview. Island back in the day when it was serious. They weren't messing around <laughs> back then. Yeah. Well, the quick sort of overview going back to like this typewriter was I, my first job was in New York. I worked in an ad agency, a big ad agency in New York. And I had a boss named Ed Hannibal and he quit and wrote a novel. And the novel was a smash overnight hit. And he became like a star overnight. So I'm like 22 years old. I said, well, shit, why don't I do that? What am I wasting my time here in advertising? (laughs) So I quit and (laughs) And I was an overnight success too. It was only 30, it only took 35 <laughs> years. But no, seriously, what happened was I sort of tried to write this novel, which was way over my head. I had no clue what anything was. And I basically had a nervous breakdown and blew up my marriage and everything else. And I wound up kind of on the road for a bunch of years and, uh, you know, carrying a typewriter like this, which I never touched. And this is sort of anybody that's read The War of Art. I was the the concept of resistance with a capital R 
that was what was beating the hell out of me. My, unlike you, Jack, who knew that he wanted to be a writer and was prepared for it, I was just uh, overwhelmed by it and, and terrified of it. And anyway, after many jobs, I drove trucks, I worked in the oil fields, I picked fruit, I worked for ad agencies again, I taught school, blah, 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 blah. And I finally kind of wound up in Hollywood. And I had like a 10 year career as a screenwriter. And that was sort of my college education as a writer, you know, sort of what you sort of knew, you know, just from the get go. And then at one point I wrote a book, The Legend of Bagger Vance, and that became a movie. And that sort of launched me onto a, a career of writing books. And that's been like the last 25 years for me. So uh, I just kind of knocked the, around for a long time. Yeah. And so that, uh, that so the Chevy van. You're, you're in the Chevy van and you're doing, going to these different jobs, working your way across the country. Don't you hop back to New York at some point and then- Yeah, I did, I did it a couple of times. Like one of the things that I would do is I, I would work in advertising for like two years, save all my money, quit, and go to someplace cheap and just live and write a novel. And, then, and I did that three different times and none of them sold. Mm. And um, But that was kind of a way of- you know, of uh, the school of hard knocks way of learning how to, how to write something, how to write a sentence. And how did you get that foot in the door in Hollywood? I've heard you talk about the difference between a writer and a writer producer um, on different projects and what that means and who you got teamed up with and how that all came about. So how did that, uh, how did that initially start? You roll into Los Angeles in a van and then, and then how, did, <laughs> <laughs> and how does it happen? Like what happened from actually, there? I actually, uh, well, I'll, I'll go back a little bit. This third novel that I wrote that I couldn't even get my mother to read, <laughs> uh, I, I was really at the end of my rope, like, you know, really thinking of getting out one of those meat cleavers and cutting my <laughs> head off. Um, and uh, I, I thought, well, why don't I just go to Hollywood instead of killing myself? You know, I've failed as a novelist. Or maybe I'll fail as a screenwriter and that'll be the next phase. And I happened to have... A, uh, a female friend who had worked for an agent. This is while I'm in New York. And she said, well, you got to write a screenplay. You know, you got to have a piece of material. So I kind of went down to the store, got a book, how to write a screenplay. And the short version of it was I did get an agent. So I went out there and I had an agent, but I like for about five years or six years, I couldn't sell anything. I just was, I wrote like nine scripts. Each one took me like half a year to write. And I'm, while I'm working jobs, and um, finally, my agent said to me, would you object to be if I teamed you up with an older established writer? And I said, no, because I'm desperate, you know. <laughs> so he did team me up with uh, a guy named Ron Chusset, who did the original Alien, he and his original partner, Dan O'Bannon. And I worked with him for about five years. And that sort of got me, you know, at least making money and in, in the game. Yeah until we had a falling out and bump it a bump. But, uh, that was how I originally, uh, you know, got into it. Got it. And then from there, do you go off and do a couple of screen screenplays on your own after that? Or do you dive back into novels or how does that, are you doing both at the same time? How does that We work? sort of, uh, you know, my, my, my partner at one point, you know, I was like the slave, right? It was a good thing in the sense that I, oh, the difference between a writer producer and a writer writer. Uh, my partner, Ron, was really a writer producer, meaning that he he had great ideas. Like if you remember the first alien, when the thing bursts out of the guy's chest, yeah. out of John Hurt, that Everybody was his idea. That. He was the kind of guy that would have great ideas, Yeah, but he was not somebody that could sit down at a keyboard and actually write. Yeah. So he needed to have a partner who who did that. So I was sort of the writer writer of the group and he was the writer producer and he was the guy that was the brand name. He was the guy that got us into meetings, got us jobs, so on and so forth. So at one point, after we'd been working for about four or five years, I felt like I'm doing all the work and I sort of demanded more credit, in which case we had an immediate divorce. Right? <laughs> you know, it was like, no, you can't have any credit. So I did say, so I did, you know, just sort of go out on my own and, and, it, and it worked to my amazement, you know. Did you keep the same agent? That. I'm sorry. Did you keep the same agent or did you switch agents? Yeah, I kept at that the same well? agent. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Or actually I had another one after that. Um, but you know what, Jack, let me ask you a few things. I wanted to talk <laughs> to you about a couple of things. I want to talk about the devil's hand for a minute. And all let's right. Get, all right. Because 
I can't tell you how much I enjoyed reading it and how it totally hooked me from page one and just pulled me through. And what, and I, you know, no offense to anybody else that's writing in this genre, but I can't believe there's anybody better than you oh. at, at what you're doing. And it's really, it's, you know, it's just a joy to read. Boom, straight through it. Congratulations. It's great. Thank but you. when I wanted to it's ask you, I wanted to ask you, this is seriously writer to writer's kind of shop talk. Is that okay mm. if we do this? For Absolutely. A um, let's say, let's imagine that there's somebody listening that says, I want to write thrillers. I love thrillers. I want to write them. I wanted to ask you, what are the, the conventions of a thriller? Um, and I, I'll get you started with a couple. And then I'd love to hear you talk about this for a minute. Like one of the things, and tell me if I'm wrong about thrillers is they're always written in the third person. Right. It's never I or maybe rarely. Rarely. There are they do exist, but uh 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 Nelson DeMille has done a couple like oh, has that. He? Um there's a few guys out there. Uh Mark Graney just experimented with it in his past, not the book this year, but the one previous. So it, it does happen, but you're right, it's not uh, it's not but common. it's it's hard to do, I think, because you sort of skip around, right? You're there's one scene in America, one in Russia, one in a submarine, whatever. Mm-hmm. And the other thing I while I'm trying to get you going on this, Jack, is that many thriller writers have a character that's a repeating character. Mm-hmm. You know, like James Reese's in your in yours, or uh, Jack Reacher, or something like that, mm-hmm. that goes on from book to book. So, um, tell me, what are some of the conventions of a thriller? So, I think every author that you ask this question to that it works in that space and writes a a medical thriller now, or a legal thriller now, political thriller now, military thriller now, techno thriller. There are all these different subgenres of uh-huh. thrillers. Um, and each one will probably give a slightly different answer based on their own experience as a reader, I think. So uh, so my perspective on this comes from the fan perspective, from the reader perspective, uh-huh. from someone who has been inadvertently studying this my whole life because I love reading, because I love the genre, um, because I love these stories. I love the books that had protagonists, main characters with with uh, who had backgrounds that I wanted to have in real life one day. So I was nat- I naturally gravitated to Tom Clancy and Nelson DeMille and David Morrell and AJ Quinnell and JC Pollock and Mark Olden and Stephen Hunter and all these guys in the eighties and nineties who had protagonists with backgrounds in Vietnam, either as Marine snipers or army special forces or Navy SEALs or CIA special operations or something along those lines. So, um, so my background, so that my answer is informed by that reading experience throughout my entire life, really. So, um, for me, that uh, those elements that make a good thriller, I think, um, is that there's a, there seems to be the ones that I liked anyway that I uh-huh. think, that I was drawn towards and identified with had some element of conspiracy in there. Ah, uh-huh. so, uh-huh. so and, and I don't think everybody will give that that same answer, but uh, but for me, I liked those. Uh, I liked that that element of revenge in there uh-huh. as well. Um, there doesn't have to be a uh, you know a, a huge twist. But a, a surprise, uh, hints. Um, I loved parts of these thrillers that, uh, uh, I mean, obviously what you're, the goal is, is to have somebody turn the page at the end of the chapter, not put it down. Keep them up uh-huh. throughout the entire night. And when they get to the end of the book, have things resolved enough where they feel satisfied with that reading experience, but also leave them with that uh-huh. one <laughs> little thing that makes them want to get the next book. Right. I don't think you, you can't just stop it. And leave all these things unresolved because they've spent, they've trusted you with their time at this point. Right, right, and right. Their most valuable asset. And they get to the end and there's no resolution. And then you have to get the next book. So that's the art part of it is trying to figure out where you leave those resolutions. How much is, is the, uh, how much resolution does the reader need uh, to feel satisfied, but then also really want to get that next book. So, which you certainly um, did in the devil's hand. Well, it's thank certainly, you. It's like we're waiting <laughs> for the next one. Yeah. Thank you. So that's the goal. But the elements, um, of a, of a thriller, that conspiracy one is the one that pops out to me. Um, uh, and maybe in like my first novel had the main theme was revenge. And you gave me that idea to have right. that yellow sticky next to my <laughs> computer that said revenge without constraint on it, revenge on it. So I just had that right there the entire time I was writing that first novel. Um, so I like that. I identify with that. So even if that's not the main theme of the other books, uh, thus far, there's, there's that sub theme of revenge in there, because I think as readers, as humans, we all identify with that because we know we can't 
do that sort of thing in real life because laws uh-huh. keep us from doing uh-huh. that. <laughs> you know, actual laws and uh, and uh, and moral, ethical type considerations. But uh, but there's something very satisfying about reading about someone who who sheds those societal norms and gets that revenge, whether it's uh, a yeah. book or a movie. There's something just very satisfying about that. So uh, for me, those are two important elements of uh, of any thriller. Let me ask you another thing, Jack. I noticed that like almost all the thrillers that I read. Um, one scene will take place in one place and then you'll cut to another scene with a completely different characters, you know, like your scenes at the very start with the box cutters and you, there's a, like a chapter of a Muslim woman that works cleaning the airplanes mm-hmm. and, and it's just a chapter about her and a little bit about her life. And in the end, she tapes box cutters under a couple of seats prior mm-hmm. to nine 11. And then the scene will cut to, to Russia or to, you know, to, so you might go, 10 scenes in a row where each one is in a different place. And like your central character might not be in any of those scenes. Is that something that you deliberately do or is that in all thrillers or what do you think about that? I think it's it's something that I deliberately do um, because I liked that in the books that I read growing up and continue to read today. Um, I like to uh, to end in cha- a chapter wanting to know what happens next. And sometimes you need to go and continue that in the next chapter yeah. to leave it hanging and then jump right in. But that's the art part of it. Once again, that's, that's the heart. Um, I mean, you can follow formulas. I've never done that, but you could, I guess, follow a formula if you do enough reading on how to write and that sort of thing. Um, but, uh, but you can do everything quote unquote, right, but miss that one important piece, that heart. These novels uh-huh. have to have heart, and that's what makes them stand out from all the other ones that are out there. So you have to put so much of yourself into them that uh, that that reader can connect with it because they know that you had this passion going into these pages, uh-huh. into these sentences, uh, so they know that they can trust you with that time. And uh, so, so I like to jump around because for the, well, not all the time, but um, but for the most part, I do go back and forth um, because I don't want the reader to also f- to forget what's been going on. Um, and I want to keep it fresh enough where they turn the page, go to the next chapter, and it changes scenes, but maybe it's something that happened three chapters ago, continuing that part of uh-huh. the storyline. And then at the end, obviously they all have to go together. And that's part of that resolution where the reader goes, ah, now I uh-huh. see, now I see where all these different, uh, yeah. disconnected, uh, chapters, people, events, uh, all come together at the end. And now it makes sense. So, uh, so that's just something that, that I do. And I, I didn't get that from a book or anything. I got that from books in general as uh-huh. a fan, as that reader. So uh-huh. um, I just write what's uh, what's really in here. I mean, I'm, I'm sort of the same way. Like I know when, when, uh, when I was a screenwriter and if I was going to be writing a Western, I would just go to the theater and just watch like, or go to the video store and watch 10 of them, you know, mm-hmm. and I would just sort of study them. And I'd ask myself, you know, what are the scenes that they, every Western has and how do they, you know, and you sort of imbibe it by osmosis rather than, than, uh, the, um, you know, studying it or anything. Yeah. But I want to ask you a couple other things. It seems to me that like a Tom Clancy story or certainly a Jack Carr thriller is, is hardware heavy in a Mm -hmm. sense. That's like another aspect of it where the, not only the weapons, but the vehicles and even, and particularly like the the fight scenes, including the hand-to-hand fight scenes are something that if you're a geeked out reader, and this is where it's great that you really were at a 20 year career as a Navy SEAL and did all this stuff that like when a fight scene is happening, James Reese is in the overturned van or something. As you're reading it, you're saying, well, this isn't bullshit. You know, this is what how it really go- goes down. And I think readers l- love that. Right. Would you say that you feel like you've got to kind of give them that? I think so. But it's very natural for me to do so. It would uh-huh. be very unnatural for me. Uh, to just have a character that picks up a knife, or picks uh-huh. up a firearm without describing it, because there's it's an opportunity to uh, to develop that character through his choice of weapons, through his choice of how he carries that weapon, his choice of belt, shoes, and all those things are opportunities for me to tell a story about that person, to include the vehicle. 
Um, now, in Tom Clancy's case, uh, he goes very deep, obviously, into submarines, onto intercontinental ballistic missiles, like all those things. And I read those growing up, and I probably didn't understand a quarter of that stuff that he was in sixth grade, fifth grade, sixth grade, seventh grade, yeah. reading those types of things. That's a lot uh, yeah. to be digesting back then. Um, and I do that not at that. I would never be able to describe a submarine the way that he does or a weapon system that has uh, some sort of a strategic type of, uh, of impact like these intercontinental ballistic weapons. Um, but, uh, but you know what? I can bring in my knowledge of an M4, of, uh, of a uh, Winkler Tomahawk, of a Dynamis Blade. Like these sorts of things uh, are very natural for me to describe and talk about because they've been such a part of me from before I was in the military. I was just always yeah. a student of weapon craft, a student of warfare. Uh, so it's very natural for me to, uh, to incorporate all these things into the storyline. It would be hard for me not to do that. Uh -huh. I'd, have to, I'd have to really hard try hard not to uh, to to incorporate those things in a way that uh, that helps develop the character for those who 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 understand um, how the how how that uh, what that means for someone to carry yeah. a 1911 cocked and locked in a leather holster on a leather belt that sort of thing driving an old F150 from 1975 different from someone driving a new Ford Raptor with uh, a right, fire right. pistol and a Kydex uh, holster right. with a nylon belt, uh, that sort of thing. So all these things tell you something different about the character. And they certainly, they add tremendous credibility and authenticity to it. You know, as you're reading, you feel like, ah, oh, this is the real deal. This guy really knows what he's talking about. And then, you know, just to, to, to contrast what we were talking about, about um, switching from scene to scene, I was thinking about my own book, A Man at Arms, which is mm -hmm. a, kind of a different thing, where the central character, Telemon, is in every scene. Right. And so I sort of envy you when I'm, when I'm reading, you know, The Devil's Hand. I thought, you know, I wish I'd love to do that, too, or you cut around back and forth. But but certain books you can't. You really It's like in movies where Tom Hanks might be in every scene in the movie, you know, or something like that. Let right. me ask you another thing, Jack, while I've got you here. Yeah, yeah. Or you've got me. <laughs> um, somebody asked me this question the other day, and I didn't really know how to answer. They were talking about writing a fast-paced book that – Kind of, you know, right? That keeps you moving and keeps mm -hmm. you turning the pages. And certainly the devil's hand in all your books are really fast paced. How do, how do you do that? So I don't do it consciously. Uh, in fact, I start off a little slower uh, consciously um, in that I want to build up to something. Um, it's just not, it's thus far anyway, it hasn't been natural for me to dive right in with, I mean, there's action in the beginning, but there's, but there's not, um, I guess it's not a sustained, like I need to describe, I need to build up this foundation uh, for the reader, for an understanding as things move forward. So although, yes, they might start with an action here in a, in a prologue or in that first chapter, um, I do settle it out. And that's conscious because that's what I liked to read. Uh -huh. up, and that's what I still uh -huh. like to read today. I like to get an understanding. I like to understand uh, the history. I like a little, some character development, even if it doesn't come right off the bat. I like having that prologue or first chapter that that generates some questions, and uh -huh. then slowly those are answered over the course of the novel, and then it speeds up throughout with a couple of hard hits in there um, and settles back, and then it has to end with that resolution. So, uh, and hopefully in a thoughtful way, um, all the violence, uh, the character development, um, I do put a lot of thought into that, um, but I want it not to just be my thought into it. I want it to be thoughtful, if that makes sense. Uh -huh. Thoughtful violence. Um, and, uh, so I do spend a lot of time developing that, but once again, it's very, it's very natural for me to do that. Um, uh -huh. but I do, I do, I am conscious of not just starting off and maybe this will change over time, depending on the book and the theme and the storyline and all that sort of thing. Um, but just like start off with something, a hard hitting car chase and then maintaining that pace throughout. I think it's a little bit exhausting for, for the reader. You need to have that, just like in a movie, um, you have to have that time for the, for the audience, the viewer to sit there, relax, have a bite of popcorn, have a little uh -huh. bit of, the, of Coke or Pepsi or whatever, uh, yeah. and, and think about what just happened and then question what might happen going forward. Cause I think if you don't give the reader or the viewer, uh, a, ch a chance to do that, they're just they're here the whole time without uh -huh. being able to think ahead and have that that oh, I wonder what's going to happen. Oh, and get that sort of a reaction. It's just and you uh, and you uh -huh. there's no there's no pace to it. So uh, so I do think about that. But so far, it's been very natural for the books uh, to go that it, way. And it, you know, it feels natural when you're reading it. It oh, really does. It feels like you just 
you, uh, do you do you outline a book before you begin? How, how in what detail do you lay it out before before you begin, or do you just start in? Oh, I do. I outline for sure. I start with that uh, that one page executive summary, and this is held true uh, for all the books to include book five that I'm working on now and book six because I know where book six goes. I know I have the one page executive summary for book six already so that when I'm writing, I'm not wasting any bandwidth worried about how I'm going to end book five. Book five, uh-huh. I know beginning, middle, end, uh, and then I know book six already. So I'm not wasting this bandwidth as I'm writing book five worried about book six at all. So Uh I know exactly where it's going. So all my bandwidth is focused on making book five right now the best it can possibly be without that little voice saying, oh boy, you think you're going to end this one way? Well, how does that, how are you going to start book six? Or what does that mean for the character going? I already know. So that's not there at all. All that bandwidth is right there making book five the best it can be. So I start with that one page executive summer, which is like a a flap in a, in a book, like right there, kind of Uh something similar. Uh Uh Uh-huh. Although a lot rougher, obviously, with a few other random thoughts thrown in. Um, And then I take that and turn that into an outline. And thus far, it's been prologue, part one, part two, part three, and epilogue. Um, That's just been a natural way for me to do it. I won't Ah. necessarily always do it that way, but that's kind of how it's worked out thus far. Uh, And then I get that as detailed as I can without it slowing me down. So if I get to a part where I'm like, "Ah, how's the reader going to going to, going to, is the reader going to believe this? Or how am I going to get James Reese out of this situation? And I'm not going to spend a week thinking about that. I, if I can't figure it out, I just go around it, through it, uh-huh. over it, continue, because I know I have a year to figure this stuff out. Uh-huh. I'm not going to, uh, I'm not going to get bogged down on the outline side of the house, knowing that I have all this time, because what I'm really doing is I'm adapting. I'm capitalizing on momentum. I'm looking for gaps in the enemy's defenses. I'm doing all the same things that I did on the battlefield. Uh-huh. But I'm doing it in a book. I'm doing it in a, in a place where if I mess up, the consequences aren't nearly as dire. I can sleep uh-huh. on it. I can get up and fix it tomorrow. I could go, uh-huh. I can edit it four months from now. So uh, I can figure out this six months from now. I can figure out this one problem in part two, third chapter in part two. So I don't need to get bogged down in that. I can just keep driving forward. Uh-huh. I'm I'm def- I'm a believer in that too. It's the old thing of the editor's mark of TK, meaning to come, right? And you just sort of, It's like Blitzkrieg, right? Where you hit, it's a resistance in the enemy. You just go around them, you know? You bypass the the point of resistance and you'll come back and mop it up later. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, it's very, and all these, that's what this, I mean, that's what all these books do. So when people ask me, hey, what should I read? I want to write a novel. What should I, what should I read? And, you know, I always caution them, hey, you can spend the rest of your life reading about how to do something. And it doesn't have to be writing. It can be anything. It doesn't even have to be on the creative side of the house. It can be be anything in life. You can study things almost too much. And it's very easy to do that these days because of the internet, because we yeah, just yeah. spent like back, let's say 1985. Well, there was a finite amount of things you could read on how to do something. You can go to your yeah, local library yeah. and you could read a few books on a certain subject. And that was about it. Uh, but now you could do it forever. So I think that's a... Uh, it's very dangerous uh, for someone that uh, want, that doesn't even know that it's resistance. They think they're studying. They think they're doing resist. They think they're they're doing research, but really they're procrastinating. Yeah, um, yeah. And you got to have a certain point where it's time to get down and do the work. And that's why these are so fantastic. Um, and I did want to ask you about how you do this with your with your publishing company that you started to get these these out there. And what these are for those that are watching or listening. These are books on on creativity. And these are books on leadership. These are books on life. These are so fascinating. I love these. So I always recommend these to everybody that asks me, Hey, what should I read? I want to be a writer. I want to be a screenwriter. Um, I want to do anything in the creative space. These are the books I recommend. And, uh, and I say, read these and then get to work. Uh, look exactly <laughs> what it says. It even says it right here. Do <laughs> the work. And, uh, you know, even if you do the work, there's no guarantee that you'll be quote unquote, a success or you'll get to that stage where you want, but I can guarantee if you don't do the work, you will not get there. So, uh, so I, I recommend these to, to everybody. These are absolutely fantastic. Well, thank um, you. Thanks for how, that. How Jack. did you, uh, how did you come up with, with starting to do that? What was the inspiration behind wanting to do this series of books on creativity and resistance? Um, they, they started with the one book, the war of art. And I have one more question I want to ask you. I know yes. we're, can we run a little long? On absolutely. Time is, oh my oh, gosh. You have a, yes, absolutely. I mean, I started with the one book, The War of Art, and that was basically, I'm sure you'll relate to this completely, Jack. 
being a professional writer, your friends would come to you and they'd say, I've got a book in me, you know, and I know I want to write it, you know, and I would sit down with my friends like till two in the morning, you know, over coffee and beer and whatever, tr telling them, you know, and trying to psych them up and mainly telling them about resistance with a capital R, their own tendency to procrastinate, to sabotage themselves, to fuck up, et cetera, and just kind of psyching them up to, you know, sit down and do the freaking work, you know? And of course, nobody ever listened to me. So after doing this like <laughs> 10 times, I finally, I had like a couple of months off and I thought, I'm going to write this down and then I'll just give it to somebody. Here, yes. read this, you know? So that was how the War, War of Art started. And Sean... Coin, my partner, published it. He had his own company then. And then after that, we just sort of decided, well, let's do another. And then let's do another. Let's yeah. do another. And they've and so they've the bunch of follow-ups came after that. Yeah, no, those are fantastic. Um, and for anybody watching, listening, you can get through these fairly quickly. Um, and which is also wonderful because it's not intimidating. Um, some books, you know, some, some other ones up there on the shelf that might be a limited, a uh, little intimidating because just because they're thick. These ones not thick. And you can get through these fairly quickly. And there's so much valuable information in here and not, not just information, but wisdom. And that's the, that's the, the key is taking past experience, whether it's successes or failures, and then applying that, those lessons to future decisions. And that's what we call wisdom moving forward. And that's what we, a lot of people tend not to do uh, at the strategic level. when we're talking about uh, politicians and everybody else who can study our history and hopefully yeah, yeah, take lessons yeah. <laughs> from history and apply those to future decisions. But uh, we're lacking a lot of wisdom, I think, uh, uh, in a lot of spaces these days. But that's what these are. These are uh, these are books about really about wisdom. You sharing that, and I sincerely appreciate you doing that. I think I have a note in one of these. Actually, I think we talked about it. Um, uh, yeah, I wrote. There's a man going around taking names, Johnny Cash, uh, and I got it from page 71. And so that was one of the things that. Uh, for my first novel, The Terminal List, that kept me kind of on that path was having that theme of revenge. And ah. uh, Simon and Schuster, they took out all my uh, Johnny Cash quotes uh, oh, from they that did. song because <laughs> uh, they're like, ah, oh, there's the uh, there's rights with the estate and all that stuff. So I was allowed to keep one, which was there's a man going around taking names because ah. Johnny Cash took that from somebody in the 1800s, and it's an unknown source. So we were allowed to use uh, use that one without any copyright issues, but. This one, what did it say? I said 71. So yeah, here, right here. And this one says, be brave, my heart. Plant your feet and square your shoulders to the enemy. Meet him among the man killing spears. Hold your ground. So I have that highlighted here in, uh, in Turning Pro. So that obviously resonated as the, essentially that's, every that's single. A quote for anybody that's listening, that's a quote from the real life warrior poet Archilochus. Uh, from like uh, the seventh century BC. That's a true quote. I'm, it's nothing I, I made up or anything. Amazing. Um, oh, so I wanted to ask you one thing, Jack. Yes, yes. But getting yes, back sir. to thrillers and and the way thrillers operate. I know some books. This is about character. Some books will be, not thrillers, but other types of books will be all about examining some character, Hamlet, you know, mm. or something that really go in depth to that. And I wanted to ask you how. How do you, or how can I put this? How much weight do you put in, say, uh, in, in any book? Because I know you, like, you're going to have six books and probably a lot more with James Reese. How much weight do you put into the character of, of James Reese as opposed to the action or, or whatever else there is? A lot. Um, so I think that these books are resonating with people. One, because of that authenticity piece, because I take those emotions and the feelings behind certain events that happen downrange or in, in life in general. Uh -huh. And then I take those and apply them to that completely fictional narrative. So although it's a fictional thriller, political thriller, uh, the emotions that the protagonist feels come from a real place. So it, so it feels like it's real, but not just the protagonist. Well, I'll stay with the protagonist, stay with the main character for a second. Um, we're all on journeys. We're all on that hero's journey. Um, I was introduced to Joseph Campbell very early in, in life in 1988 through a series of interviews he did with Bill Moyers on PBS called The Power of Myth, um, found Here with a Thousand Faces uh, right after that. And of course, that resonated. And either, I think it was just subliminally, I started applying that hero's journey to things that I read, to the things that I saw, 
on mm -hmm. uh, movies or on television um, and just hey, would would apply that journey to, hey, did this work? Why did I not like this movie as much as this one? Or why did I not like this book as much <laughs> as this one? Is it because uh, is it because that main character didn't interact with a mentor along the way? Is, mm -hmm. is that why? Is it because mm -hmm. he didn't uh, he didn't face that that crucible in the way that he could use either knowledge or a tool that was passed on to him? Did he not come back from where he started and pass on those lessons? Like were there mi missing elements? So in life, we're all on this journey, and so my books aren't just James Reese in another situation, and then I pick him up the exact same character, drop him in another situation, in the next book, pick him up, drop him. He's an evolving character because we're all evolving along our own journeys in life. Um, no one's staying stagnant. Even if you think you are, you're probably not. You're evolving. Time is passing and you are choosing how you're going to spend that time. Um, and so is my character, James Reese. He's along this journey. He's trying to figure out what he is. Is he a killer? Is he a soldier? Is he a hunter? What What is he in life as he hopefully takes that, what we talked about, those lessons learned from uh -huh. previous experiences and applies them going forward as wisdom. Um, so we're all on this journey. So I want the reader to be along on that journey with James Reese as he evolves, as he grows, hopefully, um, but maybe he stumbles a few times, maybe like we all do in life. Um, so that'll all be part of this journey. So it's not just the same character dropped in different scenarios. So I'm very cognizant of that. And then also even just characters that appear for one chapter, like the, the woman you mentioned in, in the yeah. prologue to the, the devil's hand, she needs a background. And, uh, I want people to connect with her on some sort of a, a level. And even though she might never be mentioned again, um, she has to have this background and the connection. She just can't be a person with a name from a country. That's it. No, she has to have something that humanizes her to the reader. Uh, and that includes bad guys as well. They have to, for me anyway, I like uh -huh. to have that background because we all have it in real life. We all have baggage. We all have failures. We all have successes. We all have things that shape us. So even for minor characters um, that just show up for a few paragraphs, I have that background in there. And I think that's important. L let me ask you, Leo, this is bringing me to another question. Uh, the bad guys, the villains, yes. how much, uh, how much thought do you put into the villains and what, what are the, what do you, what characteristics or what do you need in a villain? What makes a great villain in a thriller? I love writing the villains because uh, for me, for James Reese, it's, um, I won't say easy. I, I never use that term, but uh, I don't have to go and interview, say, a Navy SEAL sniper from Ramadi at the height of the war and then take the answers to whatever questions I ask from him and then have it filtered through whatever biases I have, whatever other research I've done, uh, and then spit that back out into a fictional narrative. So there's all these, like playing that game of secret along the way almost. Um, I can just remember what it was like to go into Ramadi at the height of the war and set up in an abandoned building or go into somebody's house and do, do the job. So uh, then I can take that feeling and emotion and apply it directly to that, to that fictional narrative. Now for, let's say, a lobbyist, I don't have any touch points with lobbyists, uh -huh. uh, politicians, no touch points there. It's something that uh -huh. I would never want to do. Uh, I can't imagine. I mean, even though politics is the art of compromise, <laughs> I just, I'm not a very good at that, <laughs> at uh -huh. the compromise piece. Uh, I understand its importance in that realm, but it's not something that I'm attracted to. Um, I was, it, it was in my DNA to be uh, a Navy SEAL and to be a writer. Um, it is definitely not in my DNA to be a politician. So I have to put a lot of thought into that. And luckily there are a lot of real world examples that our politicians give us almost daily, uh, where uh -huh. hypocrisy or, you know, twisting uh -huh. of laws or just, you know, whatever. We have so much material out there that I can draw on. Uh, and same thing on the lobbyist side of the house. I can, there's so many books out there about lobbying and this sort of thing. I can really, I can, uh, I can take real world examples from multiple sources and then morph them into a single character that, uh, that has a trait or two traits that, uh, that I want to explore or exploit, uh, as a, as a novelist. So, uh, so it's so much fun for me to go into the, to, uh, to the bad guys and to develop those uh -huh. bad guys. And then when I'm talking about someone that's not a lobbyist, that's not a politician, but that's a terrorist or something like that. Um, well, I have a background, uh, on the, as far as the history side of the house goes, the personal experience side of the house goes, I've done a lot of reading, obviously, on terrorism and insurgencies and counterinsurgencies and warfare that I can weave in to these different characters to develop them and hopefully humanize them a little bit uh -huh. uh, along the way. So, uh, so I, that those parts are probably the most uh, the most fun for me as an author. Will Will you ever do Jack? Will you like uh, like I will sometimes for my villain, I'll do a file. 
that's just about the villain. And I'll just sort of, it's really, I'll make up a whole life story for him and I'll, you know, kind of, you know, get a real handle on what's, what he's, do you do that kind of stuff too? So what I do is I write at the top of my outline, I have the name and the position. Um, and, uh, I do a lot of research into the name to make sure that it's, uh, it's accurate for the background and the part of the world. And I look at multiple spellings and then I'll call someone to ask, to confirm and, and, uh -huh. and all that sort of thing. Um, but I won't have the full background attached because I don't quite know it yet. Um, I kind of, I know exactly, I know exactly, not exactly. I know pretty much where they're from, what their point, uh, the point of them being in the novel is. So that's, that's there. But then I get to know that character through his or her interaction with other characters as I write. Uh, so as I write, particularly the dialogue I found, uh -huh. I didn't expect this going in. I get to know the personalities of these characters through the dialogue. And as they talk, their personalities come out. And then I jive back into that research to more fully develop those characters and that background to support that personality that's come out as I've created this dialogue with other characters. So that's kind of what I found uh, thus far anyway. And that's just, that just came about naturally. Ah, that's really interesting to me, Jack, because I, I sort of do the same thing. And you're talking about really, you're sort of discovering the character almost as the camera is rolling, so to yep. speak, right? Yep. Just like if we meet somebody for the first time and you're talking to them or you're, uh, you're running into someone that you, and it's all character dependent, but maybe you've met a few times or maybe it's an old friend. So there's different ways that, that you're going to interact with those people based on your background, their background, uh, what you need them to do to move the story forward. Uh, so all those things help develop those characters more fully. And I really enjoy that huh. part of it. Let me go back to the protagonist for a second. Yeah, yes. And the, char the character of the protagonist, of, mm -hmm. of James Reese in your case. Um, now, there are a lot of ways as a novelist where you can kind of reveal character, right? You could do an interior monologue, mm -hmm. right? You could have James, you know, talking about this and that. and and uh, Which is different than a screenplay, as you know. Uh, yeah. I've, I've learned a lot about this over the last year working on these the scripts for the Amazon series. So very yeah. different, which is which is. So much yeah, fun for that's me really to interesting, that isn't it? Because yeah. you can only use what they say or what they do. You right. really can't get into that voiceover is really like yep. a no-no. Um, but is there a, a a way that you will reveal James Reese's character to the to the reader, or are there ways that you deliberately say, "I'm not going to do that," like I'm not going to have an extended interior monologue, or or do you? Nope. It's what comes, it's what comes naturally. Um, uh -huh. so I don't start off with, Hey, I'm not going to do this, but I definitely start off with, uh, Hey, I'm going to do this. If that makes mm -hmm. sense. So I'm going to have him question certain things. I'm going to have, let's say, uh, Katie, uh, question him about something or have her think about something that he said, or look, notice something that he does and have her question it. So there's all sorts of ways to develop those characters, whether it's from the person's point of view or from someone else's point of view, observing them, which is probably even more, more powerful way to, to do it, I think, or thus far it has been anyway. Uh, and there's a few different points where I want to do that throughout each story, knowing that a reader, um, might miss it if I just throw it in once. Uh, and I found uh -huh. that out from the first novel, the, 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 my editor had very few edits for, for all the novels thus far. And I give you credit for that because of that yellow sticky that I had that brought everything back to that theme <laughs> of revenge. And the second book, everything brought back to that theme of redemption. Third book, everything that brought back to the dark side of man. Um, so as I was writing, whether it was a paragraph, a sentence, a chapter, they all had to somehow directly or more importantly, indirectly tie back to those themes. Um, and so there was very, there were very few few edits. Um, ah. but, uh, but one, but one of the edits that was in there, um, was, uh, was about that very thing was about, Hey, you've been involved with this book, um, for the last year and a half. Um, the reader's reading it once they're reading it for the first time. So right. what, you know, you think you're giving something away, <laughs> right, right? One right. sentence, one word that's hidden in there, once all these other words. Uh, and you think that by dropping that one in there that you've, You've blown it. You've given it away. You want to give a hint as from what's to come, but not give it away, perhaps, so that when the reader gets to the end, they they go like, "Oh, now I remember what that in chapter seven. Yeah, when, yeah. Uh, when the author wrote this, or the character said this, or this person did this." Um, and so my editor said, "You know, but the reader doesn't. 
Uh, so you need to add a couple <laughs> other hints. Yeah, you need to add a couple other hints in here. And I thought, oh my gosh, it's going to totally give it away. Uh, and it uh, and it doesn't. I mean, a few people figure some things out, but not everybody. The, the yeah. vast majority do not. Um, so uh, so yeah, so I've, I've discovered that early on that I don't need to worry too much about um, ruining the surprise if there's a surprise, if there's a twist, um, if there's something that I don't want to reveal until a certain part of the novel. Um, but I want to hint at it that uh, that I don't have to be overly concerned that I've given it away too early when when you jack when you be now having working on the amazon series and sort of being a screenwriter do you do the thing with the index cards the three by five cards on the wall i don't you know, i know there's programs for it now where you can you know move things around on your on your computer but no i don't i don't have that yet um but i uh, copy and paste uh, uh and i had a program uh called scrivener for the third book and i thought that i would use that forever um, and I have no explanation as to why I did not continue to use that. It is set up kind of like Microsoft Word, but you can drag research into chapters. So you don't uh, have to remember the website you went to. You don't uh -huh. have to remember, oh, where's that photo that I wanted to reference for this chapter, or just describe this church or whatever it is. You drag and drop it in, uh, and it's there in a research file attached to each chapter. And then if you want to move, if you're like, hey, you know what, chapter four should really be chapter nine. Uh, and you can just drag it and drop it back in, instead of having to copy yeah, and yeah, paste yeah. and then, you know, and then go back. Cause I'm always worried if I cut that I'm going to lose it. So copy and then paste like you have to do in word this, you could just drag and drop it. And it's all constantly backing up. And I thought I was going to use it forever, but for some reason for this, for book four, for the devil's hand, I just started in word and just kept it. And probably because there's so many things going on, kids were in the house for COVID. It was so chaos. <laughs> so I just never got a chance to get organized, but, uh, but it really helped on book three to be able to use Scrivener and, uh, and to drag and drop chapters and uh -huh. to organize things. But even for this one, book five, I'm, st I'm sticking with, with word, uh, this uh -huh. time around as well. Ah, uh -huh. well, it's, you're a real instinctive writer, Jack, you know, I think I'm kind of the same way. It's sort of like, I get to the point where I say, just write the fucking thing, you know? <laughs> well, you have to get to that point now, but now with deadlines, you know, there's no yeah. messing around, <laughs> you know, uh, what was I going to, Oh, what was your yellow sticky for the devil's hand? Uh, so, well, we, so in the last year and a half, we've gotten to be good friends and you got, you let me know that I misinterpreted what you said on Joe Rogan's podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I took it as you had a yellow sticky with one word on it next to your typewriter. Uh, and it, you know, it looked in my mind exactly like the one behind you. Uh, and that kept you on theme. Uh, so that's what I did. And then once we got to know each other, you told me that that's not what you said on Joe Rogan. That's just what I interpreted back uh -huh. then. But what you did tell was a story of a, uh, a playwright who would have a one sentence theme for right. the play. And right. uh, so, so I was, so I was like, ah, okay, uh, I can have more than one word. So for, uh, for the devil's hand, it was, what does the enemy learn by watching us on the field of battle? For ah, the last 20 yeah. years at war? Ah, so that's great. It's uh it's a red, what we call in the military red selling it. So it means looking at it from the outside and kind of, um, picking apart a plan, taking about lessons learned, applying them to future battle plans, that sort of thing. So, um, so that's what I did. I wanted to put myself in the enemy's shoes. If I was Iran, China, Russia, North Korea, super empowered individual terrorist organization, what would I have learned by watching us in Iraq and Afghanistan, Syria, and a couple other places as well, but, uh, mostly Iraq and Afghanistan for the last 20 years. And uh -huh. of course, as I'm writing COVID hits and I'm in the enemy's shoes. And so I'm thinking, okay, the enemy is definitely learning something from our response to COVID. So that was real time incorporation. Ah, and then uh -huh. a summer of civil unrest that kicked off while we were together, actually, at, yeah. uh, up at Thunder Ranch last year. And uh, so once again, the enemy is learning from these things. They're not just looking at these things with a passing interest or and going about their day. No, they're looking at uh, at these things and figuring out how to uh, exploit our weaknesses. Uh, same thing, a very contentious political season, an election cycle, once again. They are learning from these things. So the book became a lot more timely uh, than when I outlined it, than I initially anticipated when I outlined it in August of 2019. I had no idea that 2020 ah, yeah, yeah, was going to turn yeah. into such a pivotal year in our country's history and the history of the world. So uh, so I, I've expanded my one sentence, my one <laughs> word theme ah, oh, uh, into a sentence or possibly two uh, for future novels. Well, it really worked, Jack. And it really, oh, that, that really comes through when you read the book, you know, that that's, that uh, we're being watched, you know, and people are learning from us and we're making mistakes. Yeah. Oh, certainly. Um, it's certainly true. There's, yeah. no, there's no doubt about it. You know, just to throw in a little thing of my own for in a man at arms, my newest book, 
speaking of the protagonist, I made a really conscious decision that you would never go inside his head. Telamon of Arcadia, this Roman legionary that's on a mission in the first century AD, and that everything you would learn from him, it would be from the outside. Because I wanted, like it was that. like a movie, like shooting a movie, because I wanted him to be what he was to me, which is kind of a man of mystery, mm -hmm. that I don't quite understand what he's what he what he wants and and that sort of thing. So you would always see him through the eyes of one of the other other characters, and uh, that's another thing. And I find and you do this too, Jack, and it's very helpful. I think I say this for writers that are watching us now or listening to us now that when another character, a subsidiary character, reacts to our main character or talks about them and says, this guy is a liar, everything he says, you know, or he's only in it for money or whatever it is, that can be a great way of, of, de of de delineating the character's character. Because a lot of times, of course, the people will be wrong. The people mm -hmm. that are sussing out the character, they'll be revealing their own prejudices. But, yep. and I noticed that, uh, it happened. People do screenwriters do that in movies a lot too, you know. Particularly a like a, a western where you have a kind of a mm -hmm. taciturn gunslinger, a Clint Eastwood type of character. Other characters will comment on them. And samurai movies they do this too. Mm -hmm. It's a great technique to have other people react and 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 make observations. Oh yeah, that's, I think that's probably more fun uh, for for whatever it reason. It is and more fun. powerful. Yeah. Um, as, as well. So I use that in, in writing, obviously it happens in the screenplays, um, and the scripts for the, for the series and for any, for any movie. But, uh, and of course there's that, um, I forget who said it, John Gardner, I think was credited. A couple other people have been credited with, uh, saying, Hey, there's, there's only two stories in all of, of, uh, of fiction. It's, a a, a stranger comes, a stranger comes to man goes on a journey or a stranger comes to town. Uh, you know, uh, that's, you know, there's, there's a lot, uh, sure. there's a lot to that. And especially in the Western genre, when we're talking about Westerns and then, uh, with a lot of that crossover into, uh, the samurai films, uh, they share a lot of the same characteristics. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but, uh, there's a lot of that. There's a lot of that stranger comes to town or man, man goes on a journey, particularly stranger comes to town. When we're talking about Westerns or the samurai films, those tend to be, uh, quite powerful. Uh, yeah, because there's that mystery, and people are yeah. reacting to that person. Who is this person? And of course, Lee Child does it has a uh, you know reinvigorated that stranger comes to town uh, with, the, yeah. with the Jack Reacher novels quite yeah. successfully. <laughs> yeah, let me let me uh, let me bring this to a bit of an end here. A little, little close up. <laughs> Whose podcast wanna, is this? I'm sure because we're going to do this again. <laughs> yes, we are. But um, tell me a little bit about the series, about the Chris Pratt series. What's going on? Where does it stand? What are you doing? Oh my goodness! So it is. Uh, they're in the middle of filming right now. So it's uh, an eight-part series for Amazon Prime, uh, filming episode four right now. So um, it's. Uh, but it's. I think everybody's journey, and, and you, you, you know much more about this than I do. My experience is very uh, is a sliver of uh, of screenwriting and and the Hollywood journey as a whole. But uh, my sense is that every project is different because all the people involved are, are different and they have different experiences, different life experiences, different professional, personal experiences that they bring to it. Um, so each, every time you bring a group of people together, whether it's actors or producers or writers, um, however this, these, these people get morphed and thrown into this, uh, this mix together, they're all bringing these different backgrounds uh, to it. So I think everyone's experience is different. So mine was that Chris Pratt optioned the book before it even hit shelves. So it's not like it was out there and a bunch of people saw it and then, uh, and one chose it or 10 people wanted it or nothing like that. It was before it even came out. So uh -huh. that's part of, part of my journey. Uh, then Antoine Fuqua wanted it as well. So Chris and Antoine got together to do it, but Chris optioned it. Um, and then they, uh, put together a, um, uh, got a showrunner. So a, like, a, uh, for those listening, it's like a, uh, it's a screenwriter, but he does a lot, does a lot more. And, uh, we put together that first script. So me, the screenwriter, uh, put together that, that first script, primarily him, me just learning and then adding a few things uh -huh. here and there. And then he took that with Chris Pratt and Antoine and they shopped it around to Netflix, to Amazon Prime, to HBO, Showtime, Apple. And I guess there was some sort of a bidding war and Amazon ends up with it. Uh, so from there, Amazon dropped in a bunch of money and now you get that writer's room together. So uh -huh. you get these 15 people that are now bringing their different life experiences into it. And those are all different. And then they take your novel and turn it into, or they take the terminal list and turn it into 
uh, seven other scripts based off uh, with that foundation of the first one. Ah. Um, and then I was able to advise. How do you feel about that, Jack? Do you feel like uh, they're taking it out of your hands? Your baby is being, what's your attitude toward that? I'm just so thankful to be here and to be ah. in this, this position. And when you turn over something and you know more than I do, um, there's a lot of trust involved when, yeah. you, when you hand this thing over to somebody else. So for me, trusting Chris and trusting Antoine, um, it couldn't be in better hands. Uh-huh. And I also know being a student of this just uh, uh, my whole life is that it's going to change. You are now telling a story through a visual medium rather than on the written page. Yeah. So things are going to change. So if you're an author and you think that your story's not going to change when you bring it to, to the screen, well, you're probably not right. And if, you uh-huh. are, if you've maintained creative control, let's say if you have 20 novels, you're a huge name, you don't need the money anymore, uh, you can do what you want, someone wants to option it and you say, okay, but I'm maintaining creative control and you've never had any experience screenwriting before and you want it to stay exactly like the book. Well, I don't know. I mean, maybe it could work out, but for me, I knew, hey, look at First Blood. David Morrell's 1972 First Blood, much different than the film. Both fantastic in my opinion, Uh, So, but but very different. So I knew that things are going to change. Things are going to be different. And what's great about this is that we've taken a different look at the book in that we're telling it as a psychological thriller. Uh So I love that it's set up from the beginning to not just be a political thriller, not just to be an action type thriller. It's already different in its perspective from the very beginning as a psychological thriller. So, uh, so I like that. And I think if, if that story is told well by Amazon and by Chris and Antoine and whoever else is out there doing interviews, then the reader, the person that expects it or wants it to be exactly like the book uh-huh. knows, oh, it's already coming where they're already coming at it from a different perspective. They're already coming at, coming to it as a psychological thriller. So it's going to be different. So in their head, I think they'll be like, okay, <laughs> it's going to be different rather uh-huh. than hoping that it's going to be exactly the same, but without being prepared for it to be different. So uh-huh. I'm, uh, I'm thrilled. And for Chris, he wanted to keep it gritty, dark, primal, violent, uh, keep that, keep that, those themes alive. Uh, and that was very important to him, but he also knew that the story would need to morph because we're now telling it as an eight part series for Amazon. Huh. Do I dare ask what your relationship is like with Chris? Oh yeah. Yeah. He's fantastic. Does he uh, admire you? Does he want to be you? Is, uh, what- <laughs> I don't know about that. He's probably pretty happy with uh, how things are going for, <laughs> for him, but, uh, yeah, he's great. We, um, we linked up uh, in 2018, spent five days in the back country together, uh-huh. uh, getting to know each other in person. Um, and then uh, we stayed in touch and got to be uh, good friends over the last uh, couple of years here. And now we're involved in the project together. So uh, he's just, he, he is amazing. Such a good guy, just a normal guy, which was uh-huh. important to me because I wanted, as I wrote the character, I wanted the character to be somebody that you'd want to sit down and have a beer with, somebody uh-huh. you'd want to sit down and have coffee with but also had the training, the experience, the mindset, the drive to be able to flip that switch and do the job and get the things done that he needs to get done. Uh Um, And uh, so I thought, who's that guy that can do that? Who's the guy that that needs to take a risk as an actor? Because I'm taking a risk uh, uh, leaving the military to do this. My family's taking a risk along this journey. Uh, Who's that actor that needs to take a risk? Um, And I thought, that's Chris Pratt. Cause he's done up to this point, he's done things that are a little more fun. And back then he hadn't done when I, when I started writing the novel in December of 2014, he'd only done parks and rec and he'd only had a very small role in zero dark 30. He'd done some other things, but those are the, the two uh-huh. ones that stood out to me. Um, and I, I knew that, Hey, Tom Hanks did all these things in the eighties that were comedies. And then he took a risk with Philadelphia in the early nineties. And then from then on, he could do whatever he wanted. And I'm like, yeah. who's that guy who hasn't been the action hero yet in this way? Like he's, um, and, and as time progressed, he did guardians of the galaxy. He did, um, Avengers, he did Jurassic world. So he did these more action centric films, but not dark, gritty, violent, primal, uh-huh. not something that I thought, um, I, I thought that he, that this is a person that wants to do something different that, uh, that, and that can pull this off in a way that's going to surprise people. So uh-huh. that's, uh, Ah. And he's just fantastic. And Antoine Fuqua, oh my gosh, what an amazing man. Just uh, I, that guy is, you know, when you're in the presence of someone that you're like, there's something about this person. That, that's Antoine. Uh-huh. And he is just such a visionary, uh, such a hard worker, um, so creative and so nice. Like he's, like everybody involved in this project. And so many people have come up to me on set and said, hey, we've been involved in hundreds of films. Uh-huh. And we have never experienced 
a film that uh, has this feeling to it. Ah. They're like, everybody is so kind. This is just, there's some sort of energy here. Um, and so that's been really cool to hear from so many people on set. And, uh, and so many people also are fans of the novels. Guys come up to me on set and say, I tried to get on this movie because, or this, this film uh -huh. because, because I love the books and they want to talk to me about land cruisers. They want to talk to me about guns uh -huh. and knives and military stuff, motorcycles. Uh -huh. um, and so that's, that's been, been fun too. But What's really stood out is that it's uh, the similarities between a set and a military operation. Uh -huh. So I walked on that set for the first time, 350 people working on it. Craft food services, that's like army logistics chain. You got uh -huh. to feed the army. Uh -huh. uh, then you have the, uh, the explosives guy on set and uh, he's getting everything set up for the explosions and the stunt people to pull, uh, pull the, the, uh, the stunt people back and make them fly through the air. And, uh, and the SEAL platoon, you have your breacher, you have your explosive guy uh -huh. uh, on set. You have your transportation person that's getting the vehicles moved around and put in the right positions, getting everything set up. Well, in a SEAL platoon, you have your mobility guy. Uh -huh. uh, the actors, as they walk on, they're getting handed their weapons, uh, their night vision, their gear, all that stuff. And then when they're done, they have to turn it back in. All that stuff has to be accounted for, just like in a SEAL platoon. Uh -huh. And then you have Antoine, the, the director. He's like the commanding officer out there. And then you have Chris Pratt. He is like the platoon commander, or the troop commander, uh, setting that tactical level tone, whereas uh -huh. setting that strategic level tone. So a lot of it, uh, similarities between a military operation and, uh, and the set. Uh -huh. And when will we be able to see this? That uh, is classified, but actually I don't know. It's uh, sometime in 2022, but there's not an exact uh, date. I think uh -huh. there's, um, there's probably a lot of things that need to be worked out. They still have to get through filming without stopping because of COVID. Um, uh, yeah, in yeah. California still, if somebody gets it, they shut down for, have to shut down for a certain amount of time and, and that sort of thing. So I think there's a few, uh, few outliers in there that uh, could derail things or delay things. Um, haven't yet, so knock on wood, but, uh -huh. um, but we'll see. Hopefully sometime in 2022. Okay, great. It's great Please. to hear your enthusiasm for it. I love yeah. <laughs> those two guys, Chris Pratt and Antoine. I love the stuff oh they've gosh. done. Mm -hmm. I think it, everything you said is right on target. I can't wait to see, you know, this project when it's up on its it's, it's two feet and standing tall. Oh, Sounds like I can't wait either. I'm excited to see it. It's uh, I've seen a couple of the dailies they call them, and I've seen a couple of the rough draft director's cuts from the first couple episodes, and I'm I could not be more thrilled the way that ah, it's, great. Uh, that it's turning great. out. So. Uh, so yeah, we'll see. We'll see. <laughs> Are you gonna let me ask you any questions? My goodness, we're way over time already. And I, we barely got to a man at arms. We talked a little bit about your series on creativity over here, but look, I have, I have all these, I had all these things to talk to you about. All I'm right. Books here. Well, we'll have got, to do it again sometime. Got Jack. These ones right here. Look at this. I mean, look at all those. Uh, those are the ones that keep arriving at the house. And my wife's like, what, are, what is this? <laughs> like this one right here. Yeah. Israeli Defense Forces, the Six Day War. You know, it, it, it took a little bit to track that one down. Yeah, I bet and, it uh, did. With the First Marine Division in Iraq, 2003, no greater friend, no worst enemy. This one, though, this one right here, let's see, where is it? Ah. So I'm actually one of my characters in my, the book that I'm working on now is inspired by this. And you ah. recommended this, Jimmy. Oh, you can see it there. Yeah. yeah. Have, you, have you had a chance to read it yet, Jack? I've read it, but I haven't re I've read it the way you would do research. I haven't uh -huh. like sat down with it with a, a whiskey or a coffee and, and, and engrossed myself in it like you would a novel. So I've read it the way I usually do a lot of the books that I do research for. Oh, um, I see. Is to go through, to read beginning, read the end, read the middle, skim, check it out, like that, that sort of a thing. Do some research about it uh -huh. uh, from other sources. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but yeah, just, I mean... It, yeah, you'll see when when I when I send you book when I send you book five, you'll, okay, you'll, uh, great. you'll immediately know um, what uh, what this book's influence. I'll tell you uh, has one been. short story about that. I know we're like way over time, but when I was researching the Lion's Gate, I was in Israel and I interviewed Yael Dayan, who is the daughter of Moshe Dayan, and she's been a big. Um, she's kind of a celebrity, a writer, and and uh, um, she was was assistant mayor of Tel Aviv at the time. Anyway, I'm interviewing her and I ask, and I've read the book. I'm really steeped in that book. And I'm asking her about, you know, tell me about this. And she kept saying to me, it's in the book <laughs> or ah. it's in my other book, read my other book. It's in my, and she wouldn't, and I wanted to tell a story. So finally I just said to her, would you mind if I just stole everything in your books and just, you know, put it as if it was coming out of your mouth. And she <laughs> said, uh, she said, yeah, and maybe you'll be able to make it a better story. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> so she was very sweet. 
That's amazing. That's great. And for so for people that, um, gosh, I didn't even got to ask you any questions, but um, and I was going to take a lot of notes too. That was this is my opportunity to take a bunch of of notes from the from the master here. But well, uh, we'll have but we'll, to do we'll, it again, Jack. We will definitely do it again for sure. Uh, and for those that aren't following you, you are now in the social media realm. For a while, you had your website and you had blog on there. You had the, uh, was the Writing Wednesdays? Is that what you had yeah, on yeah, there? Yeah, yeah, So you had those going on there. I remember It's the Tribe Stupid. I read that when I was uh -huh. downrange, uh, I mean, years and years ago. So you have an amazing website, such a great ref resource for for anybody, particularly for, for authors or uh, aspiring authors, writers. Um, and then now you're in the social media realm. You have, a, you have your Instagram page. And on that Instagram page, you do a lot of book recommendations on there where a lot of these have, have come from. Um, so, so where can people, where can people find you and, uh, and what do you want? Instagram's up to? probably the main thing. And I got to say, I learned this from you, Jack, you know, <laughs> I'm following in your footsteps, you know, I thought I just, I have to have a presence out there. You know, I can't be too much old school, but I'm, I'm on Instagram on my, um, and uh, we're doing another new video series right now called The Hero's Journey. I saw where that. I kind of get into that in sort of a lot of different ways. And um, but yeah, that's it. You know, Stephen Pressfield on Instagram, and uh, I have my website. But that's about that's about it. I'm not like you, Jack. I haven't got all of the the, the apparatus yet. But we're getting oh. there. We got a good uh, <laughs> microphone here. You know. I know. I'm so impressed. It looks so good. <laughs> I mean, my goodness, that's a good one. Uh, and then, uh, and what's the next project then? What are you working on right now? And, and how does that, since we, since we are already over time, um, do you take a, I know you don't take a break. Like you start the next book a day after you finish, uh, <laughs> the, the last one, but after you do that, after you write that first paragraph, maybe, or maybe it's a, it's starting an outline or whatever that may be. Uh, do you ever take a breath or is it, are you constantly working? I, I do take a breath, you know, and my theory of this, maybe it's probably your theory too. I'm very much afraid of like what Seth Godin calls the dip, mm -hmm. right? Where you finish project six and you haven't started project seven yet. And for me, I immediately go over the cliff into, you know, despair. <laughs> and that. so I really want to, like I always say, when I finish book number, or whatever, I want to be 90 pages into the next book already mm -hmm. so that I can start, you know, the, the next day. But what, ha what I will do, Jack, is like, once I've got some momentum going, I feel on a new project, I feel like I've got a beachhead, right? The troops have landed. Yeah. You know, we've got the, you know, the food and we got the ammo. Yeah, yeah. Then I'll take a break because okay. I know we've got enough momentum that I can go back to it. Got it. Two weeks later or something and it'll be there. But I never want to just go off the cliff at the end of something, not knowing what the next thing is going to do. Gonna Interesting. Be. I'd never heard you say that before. We'd never talked about that exact thing before, but, uh, but I do the, I do that exact same thing. So when I say I start the next one the next day I do, but at the same time, then there's other things that need to get taken care of and of course, yeah, like yeah. wife and kids and all the rest of it. Yeah. I mean, you're constantly juggling all this insanity, but, uh, but yeah, I think it's important to do that as well, to get right into that next one, uh, to get, to be able to take, to be able to take that breath, to take that beachhead and then take that tactical pause yes. and tidy up a couple of things that might need, yeah. to, maybe you need you to do, do some press that. for you this do. book, you know, yeah. That, yeah. that sort of thing. Yeah. So I find that that's the, and, and if you go back and you look at authors over time, let's say, go back to beginning of the 20th century on, and you'll see authors that did take a break, um, between books and long breaks between novels, uh, and then go into exactly what you said, a state of despair, uh, a lot, a lot of alcoholism, a lot of, yeah, a yeah, lot of issues. Yeah. Uh, if you go back and study some of these guys, uh, during that, that time period. And I think that might be a reason right there is that they didn't jump right in. I mean, I don't know. I'm just thinking about this. Yeah, for the first I, I don't time. know either. But it I mean, would make sense that they didn't hop right in to that yeah. next one, that they did take too long of a break and then start to worry. And now you're taking up bandwidth with the worry. Hey, can you do it again? Can I do, uh, can I write another book that resonates with the public, with the readership, the way the last one did? And then time goes on like this. And then they, now they're adding some, some things to the mix yeah, that might not yeah. be so helpful and might be not, not, might not be so healthy. And then off they go that cliff, like you, like you just described. Yeah. So I think it's important to take that beachhead, just like in the military yeah. with, that, with any project, take that beachhead <laughs> and, uh, and then, uh, then, then take a little bit of a breath. Yeah. My my friend uh, Norm Stahl is kind of a mentor to me. He has an analogy. I don't know if I told you this. That supposedly a rat, a rat's teeth keep growing 
and at a pretty accelerated rate. And if the rat doesn't keep gnawing and wearing the teeth down, they grow back into his brain and kill him. Wow. So we've got to all keep gnawing and wearing down those teeth. Oh my time. goodness. Otherwise, That's great. I'm going to, I'm going to write that down as soon as we're off here and maybe incorporate <laughs> that into a novel, whether it's true or not. I think it's fantastic. <laughs> I love it. I love yeah. it. Awesome. Well, we are over time, but thank you so much for doing this. I mean, it, it turned into an interview of me and I really wanted to talk to you about all this stuff, but we will do it again. Um, and uh, I just want to also tell you how uh, much I sincerely appreciate your friendship, uh, your mentorship, your example. Um, I want to thank you for writing your the novels that you, you do and then also sharing uh, the wisdom that you have uh, in these series of books on creativity that everybody, whether they're an author or a sculptor or a painter or a leader, um, should have in their library uh, and should revisit often uh, until they slay that resistance. And uh, well, thanks to you, thanks to you, Jack, too. And you know, you're you're my hero. I've learned so much from you. I'm so happy that we've got this friendship that you know started. You know, whenever it was a year, year and a half ago, and uh, I know it's going to keep going. And I can't wait to see you in person. Thanks for having me. I really did want to ask you these questions, and I'm sure that <laughs> as far as anybody that's watching this, they got a lot out of this. You know, so this was a this was a good one. Oh, well, thank you so much. And uh, hopefully I'll see you in LA soon. Okay, great. All right. Take Thanks, care. Jack. Welcome to the gear highlights section of the Danger Close podcast. And since I was just talking to Stephen Pressfield about writing, about books, about research, uh, about inspiration, about uh, slaying resistance, uh, I figured I'd talk about the importance of building your library. So uh, what I love about books, whether they're uh, they're fiction or non, is the paths that they can take you down in life as you continue to build that foundation of knowledge, which hopefully allows you to turn some of that into wisdom as you move forward and can base those decisions on some of the things that you've learned from other people's experiences, not just your own, but uh, from the study of history. So uh, Stephen Pressfield's books, right here. Uh, but also he has those books and Steven, if you follow him on Instagram, uh, has recommended a lot of other books. And, uh, as you can tell, I got quite, quite a few. So build that library, especially today when it's so easy to control information because it's all online. It's all electronic. It can be edited. It can be erased. Uh, it can be canceled. And right here, this is my dictionary from 1987. I still have it. I've had many dictionaries over the years, uh, big, gigantic, uh, leather bound ones, but I keep coming back to this one because it's, it's handy. And, uh, I also like this because I can look up definitions today on the, on Google, and I can compare those definitions to the definitions of 1980. Seven. So I spend a lot of time with this as I'm writing. Uh, I just like it because it connects me to that uh, that written word and that page. And uh, so highly recommend getting a dictionary, not just a really nice one. It's very cool to have a nice one, but also getting one that you can uh, toss in a backpack that you can uh, uh, have on a shelf and not have to have to worry about. So uh, definitely have a dictionary, have a thesaurus and have it separate from what you can find online. So uh, this is mine right here. You can tell it's been beat up quite a bit over the years, but uh, every single novel, I reference this. So uh, build your library. Thank you for tuning in to the Danger Close podcast, an Ironclad original presented by Six Hour. You can find Stephen Pressfield at stephenpressfield.com and Stephen Pressfield on Instagram. And that is S-T-E-V-E-N Pressfield. And be sure and pick up his latest book, a man at arms. And if you haven't read any of his other books to date, whether it's the series on creativity or his fiction, historical fiction or nonfiction on this side of the house, it's time to get started. And if you like the conversation, be sure to leave a five-star rating and review wherever you listen to your podcasts to help beat some of those big tech algor algorithms. And I'll see you next time on Danger Close. <laughs>